Hello, everyone. How's it going? So give people a chance to uh, get in here and we will get started talking about how to not get ripped off in the world of distributing your film. There'll be stories, experiences, oddities, heroic journeys. This distribution seems to be always the most difficult thing for everyone. Um, I will be monitoring the chat. If you have questions, feel free to post them there. If you'd like to speak up and ask a question, feel free to do that as well. I'm, I'm not opposed to people asking a question. And I will go ahead and give you all a link to the last seminar I just did. Uh, it's now up and available. Um, this one will be as well to review in the future, to share with other people. The worst case scenario, I could just do a Q&A about a lot of things. I just tell stories. Okay, I will just go ahead and kick it off. Um, hey, no problem, Scott. Uh, the, uh, so basically, my name is Darren Orange. Uh, I am in Chicagoland. I directed a feature-length film called Inspectors, uh, based on the role-playing game by Jared Sorensen. Uh, and more or less, uh, Inspectors has been completely self-distributed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that experience and then what you guys potentially could be looking at doing and what I've gone through. Um, so to distribute your film yourself, there's a few different ways to go about it. Most people out there, and I know you all have the ambition, I had the ambition, I actually got it to work though, was to have it be shown in actually a movie theater um, and have it have a run. So my film inspectors with a lot of effort, um, we managed to talk to a small theater chain at the time called Movico. They only had like 10 theaters in existence. Uh, and I got to speak with their film buyer and sent the film buyer a screener. And he said, we will, we'll, we will run it like a normal feature length film. And not a premiere, not a one-time showing, but they actually ran it. I had to go um, and actually, so now I'll backtrack. So back then there were things called VPFs, uh, which is a virtual, virtual print fee, um, which you have to pay to the theater or actually to Sony in this case. Um, this is kind of some oddities I'll get into. You guys will, will probably have never known about. I didn't know about it at all. Uh, so back in the day, we had film that got sent to a movie theater, right? And film costs money. So back in the day, a typical film print, a 35 millimeter film print cost around 800 to 1,000 bucks per film print. That's what it costs. Uh, so what happened was when the digital transition occurred where the theaters went from showing 35 millimeter film to digital, they had to buy these brand new projectors. And what Sony did, Sony made most of the early ones, they made an agreement with the movie theater that any movie that got shown there would pay them a fee to be shown there. And there's what's called a house fee. So the house virtual print fee is a, a, a set rate for the, the lifetime of the run of a film, meaning if it runs for a week, two days, or a month, it's a set flat rate that you pay to Sony to help them subsidize the purchase price that they sold the projector to to the movie theater in the first place. A little bit strange, a little bit odd, I know. Um, but basically what happened is that that was okay because these projectors were, in most cases, quarter million, half a million dollars. They were very expensive, not like a film producer was usually 50, 60,000, they were much, much cheaper. So you had to pay. So in my cases, I was running the normal process of actually running a film in theaters, you had to pay $1,000 for that screen for the run, okay? And effectively, that's how it works. Now, you can do single showings, but you still have to pay that virtual print fee of about $140 a showing. So because my movie ran for about two weeks, first week it had five showings a day, second week it had two, uh, it didn't make sense to go on the one-off showing. You really wanted to go with the the full showing, basically. So what we did is we paid for that. And then with the theater, 
the agreements usually work out in most cases a 50-50 split with you, okay? What that means is that their gross receipt, they split 50% with you after sales tax. You get that 50% um, of whatever the gross receipt is. So if let's say a ticket was $10 with tax, you might get like four something for every single person that sits down in that theater. And that's a pretty good deal for the most part. Um, I don't have any complaints about it. Um, I can tell you from my experience with enough promotion and enough work that went into it, we were able to cover the cost of the virtual print fee in the run and actually end out a little bit on top. Uh, and here's where I'm gonna get into the more confusing parts is that it's very hard to get your film ready for a movie theater in how it's traditionally done. So a DCP back then, this was 2013, was hard. It's easier today, but the major problem you run into today is still true back then is that your sound mix is going to be radically different from what it was in your, in your home. So if you're mixing sound and working with sound inside your home and or inside your studio and you don't have a big budget setup, getting the mix right and getting it to where you're not peaking or blowing out the speakers in theater are very hard, right? So I'm just trying to give you guys an idea of the challenges with, with some of these things, right? Distribution can be hard. There's a lot of steps. It took me eight different screenings to get the film correct for a theater in the theater. Well, it's a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of commitment going to and from the theater to actually do that. But luckily they were nice enough to let me do that to get the mix just correct. Because one thing about a theater is that most things are mixed at roughly negative six db not like home not like music you're usually at like that zero db you want to hit that you do that in a theater that's ridiculously loud there is no volume in a theater it's just a set rate so what you're actually are hearing in a theater is a range from basically zero which is the loudest thing you can have you really should be negative two down to negative 20 voices most of the time are at negative eight negative ten sometimes negative six when they're loud. So you have to totally change your dynamic for releasing a movie in theaters. Now, how do you get into that conversation? I recommend finding your local theater like I did, talking with them and seeing if they would give you the same deal. You got to set up a, a hell of a promotion for your premiere because you're going to premiere it there. And you need to set up a, a run with them and do the same exact deal. You might get away with a theater that doesn't actually end up having uh, a VFP because some, nowadays it's not, as common but it still probably is somewhat common and you might be able to run your movie there for a reasonable run um, i recommend trying that let and and get them to show your trailer my movie had the trailer out and actually playing in front of movies in that theater a month beforehand they can do all these things they're in control of all that run excuse me i would highly recommend negotiating all that Talk to their film buyer. That's who you want to talk to. Don't talk to their events person or anything like that. Say, can I please speak to your film buyer? Now, you don't try it with AMC. Don't try it with Regal or Cinemark, most likely. Don't go with the, they're the two, three big. Don't do that. But go to your local theater chain. Here in Chicago Land, for example, we have a theater chain called Hollywood uh, Avenue and Hollywood Palms. There are two theaters. They're owned by the same group. Go and talk to someone like that or some small local group that has several theaters, not ones that have uh, over a thousand in some cases, uh, don't do that. So to move on from there, from, from having it in a theater, if, if you can't do it or doesn't work, um, try to move on from there and go to, uh, you know, direct distribution, which can be mainly, so inspectors, we didn't have a plan to release DVDs or Blu-rays, so we had the, the theatrical release. We actually ran a Kickstarter post making the film. Inspectors was made, prior to all that Kickstarter stuff, which I think is a blessing. So many people rush to use Kickstarter as a means to be able to get their film in a position to actually make it when they should be trying to use it as a way to get it into people's hands. Because the one thing that works better than anything else on Kickstarter is when you have a finished product, you just need a way of getting it out to people. If you bring people a finished product with a little bit of back history, that it's had success, that it's there, that it's a real thing, you're done with it, the chances of you having success on Kickstarter are substantially higher. So for example, we ran a Kickstarter, we only raised four grand, but we were only trying to get the movie out. Um, the, the four grand allowed us to print 1,000 DVDs and allowed us to print 400 Blu-rays for the movie. Um, believe it or not, and you go to 1,000 DVDs, even though DVDs are kind of like old news now at this point, it only costs about a buck something a DVD 
So it's not particularly expensive. I think it was like $1,400 or $1,300 shipped for a thousand DVDs. Um, so if you feel like that that's a good pathway, you could easily do that. Obviously we've not been pushing the sales of inspectors, et cetera, as much as we could be. I'm trying to get it just to maintain itself at this point, which seems to be good, which I'll talk about later with, with your questions and whatnot. Um, Blu-rays, you kind of got to go for. Digital distribution is also extremely critical. Uh, we, have, we had it on VHX, uh, which is gone now. Um, so we actually moved over to Amazon. Uh, we moved over to Amazon in its like heyday when it was just becoming a thing. Um, the only requirement for anyone to put something on Amazon is that you have English subtitles. That's it. Um, they have other regions uh, like I, I think it's Germany and Japan. If you're going to show it there, you have to have subtitles for there. Um, I don't have subtitles for there, so I don't show it there. It's shown in the UK and the US, Canada, things like that. Um, and that's all you need. And you, anyone could put their movie on Amazon. You go to amazonvideodirect.com, you sign up with all the stuff on there, and then you can put your movie or TV series, you know, if you, again, I, either or, or documentary or anything you want onto Amazon. Granted, they're going to review it to some degree, but not really. Um, just make sure that it's actually ready for release. They have certain requirements to upload the video, but it's nothing that nuts. Um, the only sad part about Amazon is that they've progressively sucked away the dollars and the money that come into you as you get your film viewed. So they pay you down to the minute viewing time at some ridiculous rate now. I think that Inspectors is getting like two cents, uh, two cents an hour. So it's hardly anything. Um, but if you were to get higher viewing at some point before they nerfed all the settings and everything inspectors was doing really well it was getting like 10 cents an hour 15 cents an hour and they eventually brought it down to where they got rid of all that because i think they were paying out too many much money to too many people um which is kind of weird you figured that they would be able to, that the system would grow and it would work but i don't i think that what's happening is that the number of subscribers aren't increasing the contents becoming too much for them to, to successfully manage financially in that regards but I think Amazon's a good call. Again, the, your goal is with your film, especially if you're looking to self-distribute, is to get it in front of people. And the easiest way for most people to view your film is on Amazon. A, you're getting something for them watching it. B, it's easy for the most part for them to watch it on there. C, Amazon also allows people to rent and buy the digital version. And icing on the cake, if you make those DVDs or Blu-rays, you can put them on Amazon and package it all together and have a nice model to sell and distribute it. So your next question to me is going to be, as I would assume, is it was my biggest thing I said, no, I would not do, is how do you warehouse, distribute, actually get them out? Uh, all, the, all the DVDs and Blu-rays for inspectors are actually at a warehouse in Indiana. Um, I don't have any of them physically, well, I have some physically here, but I don't have the pallets of these DVDs and Blu-rays physically here. It costs almost nothing to keep them there. It's something like $4 a month eight bucks a month to have it someplace. And if you get an order, because we weren't getting a lot of orders, I managed it directly. I would just send them the order, they would ship it. The shipping cost almost nothing. It was like, I think it was like, a, it's like a buck 20 or a buck 40 in most cases, because don't forget DVDs and Blu-rays are media mail. And if you have a contract with the USPS, like they do, I can't, it only costs them a buck 40 with materials, with packaging and everything to ship that to someone. And that price isn't really different for obviously a DVD or Blu-ray. So you're better off not doing any of that and focusing on more filmmaking rather than worrying about keeping thousands of DVDs or Blu-rays in your basement or in your garage or your attic. Don't do that. And then you having to package it, ship it, then pay twice the price to ship it or more and have to manage all that. Don't, don't do that. It's not worth it. Um, so I recommend that pathway. Um, all these grand hopes uh, that people have to go and take their film and then send it out and get someone to pick it up. I, again, this, I'm here to tell you guys about not doing that. I, a, for low budget productions, and if you watched my previous uh, video um, uh, or seminar on no budget film production, it's not worth it. You're not, it, it's just that the probability is you're going to get taken advantage of. They're going to take your film, give you nothing, hold on to the rights of the film. You're not going to know what you're signing, or what you're under, what you're doing and they're just gonna cheat you out of it. Don't do it for your first film, self-distribute. It's just so much easier. And I recommend getting the film done in the can, finished before you go to Kickstarter. You should be able to make a film without any help 
from Kickstarter and then use it to leverage the support to actually release it. Maybe even use it to, to leverage um, other events such as like uh, film festivals if, if you really want to. I'm not a big advocate of film festivals because they can be expensive. Some are not, that's fine, um, but it is an option. And I think in general, you're better off going with the easiest, less restrictive path because if your film gets out there, gets viewed, gets seen, gives you more opportunity to have more success and focus on the future. Um, so I have, a, and with inspectors, it was pretty straightforward. So at this point, I'm, I guess I'm gonna start taking questions. I kind of get to the point, make things simple, uh, talk to your local theater, uh, run a Kickstarter to, to produce actual physical product. Don't use it to fund making the film. Um, and then go and use the uh, uh, Amazon as a hub for everything initially until you grow and get bigger, then you can do other things perhaps. But as a beginning point, start there because it's easy. Don't keep the product in your house. Find a warehouse. It's not expensive. It's like eight bucks a month to store it there. And then you're pretty much pretty much set from there. You focus on the next project. And the cool part is your next project for Kickstarter, which I'll mention real quickly because it's being asked, leverage your first project to help your second project. If you have DVDs and Blu-rays sitting in a warehouse, you can easily make that part of the Kickstarter that can ship immediately before, before you make your move in your next project, perhaps. Um, you film it all and have it finished. Use it as so people can get something immediately and then make the film and then come back at the end for the final product. That's what I would recommend. Leverage what you've already done to help grow where you're going, uh, like a snowball effect. All right, on to, on to questions now. Uh, can you actually make money? Yeah, you can. Um, not much. You can basically help prove that their purpose, that making them was worth it. <laughs> um, but not, uh, not immediately. I don't think inspectors uh, will recoup its costs soon. Uh, may, and in fact, in most cases, my time maintaining it uh, is literally the, the value of that. Um, where do you where do you get find, uh, you do it yourself? Uh, you raise it locally, or you invest in stuff yourself? Like in my previous thing about no budget film production, uh, you should watch that. The links in the chat. If you don't see it, I'll repost it. Um, that'll show you how to get things done without much money and be successful. Because money is money is evil <laughs> when it comes to filmmaking. You should only get it for when you need it. And most of the time you can get away with almost none of it as long as you make a film that you can make versus making a film you want to make. Um, any other questions out there? You guys can unmute and ask too. I'm fine with that. We can have a conversation. It's okay. Um, any other questions? How do you push through and make a film knowing it could fail? Um, huh. Uh, I don't, I don't really ever think about it failing. Um, it depends. So films can't fail if you design them to succeed. It sounds like a, uh, a silly statement. Um, but, uh, films can't, uh, can't fail if they're designed to succeed. So if you make a project and I don't fail as a, I don't know what fail means. If you make a movie and people can watch it, that's a success. So focus on that rather than like, the, I think that you're leaning on the financial focus on that. If you can make something that people can watch, you've succeeded. Um, YouTube, I don't know. I don't view YouTube as a distribution method. It's mostly for content creators. Um, I think it's possible that you could run a YouTube channel independently of filmmaking and also TV series should be included. As you could do both. I would not use it as a revenue source. It's too hard. I've already played with it personally. Um, uh, and just trying to do some things. I've not found it to be very successful um, with that. I, I don't, I'm not a content creator in that sense. I'm not a personality. Maybe I should be, uh, but I'm not. Maybe I will be. We'll f I guess we'll find out. I haven't really done these things. Um, oh, short film. I can bring, oh yeah. So short film, absolutely, I would use uh, YouTube for. Um, if you, I don't know if you're talking about as far as distribution beyond just people being able to view it, you can also put your short film on Amazon, Amazon prime. You can definitely put your short film on there. Nothing's stopping you. Um, and it can actually immediately make you revenue for your short film. Totally. Um, then you could leverage uh, YouTube to promote for the, for the Amazon short film. Um, I've thought about doing just that. I think it's a really neat idea. I think it's going to grow. Um, and it might help Amazon 
actually gain subscribers and maybe push up some of the dollars because the viewing counts and, and ranking system is kind of weird uh, for Amazon. But yeah, I, I think that could work. I just, as far as <laughs> expecting money out of YouTube, I don't, I would never expect that unless you're focusing on just content creating, which was not filmmaking in my opinion, in the regards to telling a narrative story, you're never going to see revenue from it. Any other questions, anyone? Um, no, um, I'm not, I haven't really been, I would only subtitle, so I'm not too concerned about the E&O and M&E. Um, I, I would just subtitle, I, I wouldn't mess with any of that. And for distribution, I could, I mean, I could technically uh, put it on other channels on Amazon and have it available throughout the world. I just not doing it at the moment. I don't think it's worth it. Um, the second largest market for, for media in the world is China. So right now the U S is the top, top dog. If you can't be successful inside the country. I don't think I'd be successful outside right now. Um, unless you're already outside, in which case you should be successful wherever you are. Any other questions on any distribution filmmaking stuff in general, I'm happy to talk about any of the elements that, that help improve your prospects. <laughs> American film market. Um, Dice Geeks, have you ever been to American film market? Okay. It is quite a weird experience. Uh, I've been once after making Inspectors, thought it was going to be the holy grail of something, right? Uh, it is so overhyped. It is you, you, it's the most inappropriate place for most anyone to go unless you are some small time studio that can afford to have a booth in there. And even then I don't under, fully understand its purpose. Um, I, I, you can go, it's like 300 bucks. I think I wouldn't mess with it. Um, but you're definitely not going to sell your film there most likely, especially if, if you're thinking about self-distributing, I thought it was possible. I can tell you it's a waste of time. Uh, unless you get invited there, I wouldn't mess with it. Sorry if I crushed your, your hopes of it, but it's not what everyone makes it out to be. It's neat, but you're just kind of an outcast if you go there by yourself. It, you got to know people. I didn't know enough people. Um, and even then, I don't know that that was the right group that I was targeting. It was kind of the, the asylums of the world. The biggest person there was Lionsgate, but you know, I think it was their Grindhouse section. I don't mind that. I'd totally work with Grindhouse. But I mean, I'm just in perspective. Um, that was the biggest people there. Um, uh, did you see my question? Film festivals? Uh, film festivals, I wouldn't mess with. I, I, if you want to go ahead, I don't think that they're a way to make money or be successful, especially on the small end. By all means, try, but don't spend any more than 40 or 50 bucks a festival and don't enter too many of them. Is it kind of a money sink? Unless they're accepting you, then enter all of them. Uh, let's see. What, what do you believe makes a good filmmaker? Tenacity. Uh, you got to be a little bit rough and you got to be a little bit committed. Um, for example, <laughs> I didn't crush your enemy. Yeah, well, don't give up. Keep trying, uh, Dice Geeks. Um, it's never worth giving up. You got to keep trying. Tenacity is the most important aspect. In fact, the only reason I personally became a director is because I found that most directors suck. Most of them are terrible, egotistical, self-centered. They're not about working with people. They just want to do it for the, the glitz and glam, especially when you're talking about lower budget productions. They're mostly not that great. Um, if you want to do something amazing, be a great director. You got to love people and you got to love working with them. If you don't do that, it's, it's not really a great thing to do, I don't think. And I would never want to work with it. I've worked with directors that were jerks. I, I try to get through. I didn't want to direct like other people that I thought would do better than I could. And they were horrible. And it ended up being the, one of some of the biggest mistakes I've made early on was trying to get a director to direct. And I just wanted to produce. And that was stupid. Um, directors are like difficult to find good ones because the, they're, if they, your team can only be as committed as your director. If your director is anything less than anyone else, he is where the buck stops or she is where the buck stops or they, them, whatever you want to call a director person. Um, they're where the buck stops. So if they aren't com the most committed person on set, your movie's doomed. Um, so.
let's see is there a market for short that is not high quality yeah put it on youtube and put it put it on amazon amazon will take almost anything in short format too um no one really wants a short film one's going to buy it from you but put it out there get it out there so people can see it you need to you need stuff to be seen so you get criticized for it and you can do better the next time trust me short films are the best way to improve i highly recommend them Yes, you can, to my knowledge, you can distribute. Absolutely, because Amazon Prime works outside the US and Amazon Prime definitely allows my film to be shown outside the US. I don't see why it won't work, so. No, you'd be surprised. I did zero marketing for inspectors almost for putting it on Amazon. And deaf people are definitely watching it and that's a feature granted, but still, I don't see why they won't. With a little bit of effort, people will watch it. Make a video, put it on YouTube, share that video and push people to go watch your full length version on Amazon Prime. I keep wanting to do that. I've never done it. I, go try that. I would recommend it. Uh, well, hold more events, show more people, uh, go to more things. I mean, set up events. Honestly, I think that you could easily, if you could have submitted an event to Gen Con online and, and shown it and talked to people about it, you should do that. You still have time. Set up an event and see, it, and maybe some people will show up, talk in the green room. <clears throat> they don't, don't ever say people, you know, haven't watched it. Get it out there and talk to people. You, you got a huge opportunity right now. Rock and roll. Go for it. I think uh, created, created content sites like Patreon. Um, Patreon can be good for content creators. I, I still haven't figured out how to make it work for productions like a feature or TV series, maybe for a TV series, it might work. Um, I, I think you could get away with it. If you had a documentary series that was following you trying to make the film, but I, I don't know that there's any good way that that makes sense to use it, you know, um, Sorry, I, I, I don't know the page. Patreon's for content creators. You, you were technically content creators, but not in the habitual kind of way that like someone on YouTube or elsewhere are usually. Um, Vimeo versus YouTube. I don't like Vimeo, but I, Inspectors is available for free to view right now while Gen Con uh, is going on up on Vimeo. It's also on Amazon Prime. Um, I, I prefer YouTube. It's just easier to stream. Then again, I'm, I'm a Google person. I'm an Android user and all that. So maybe that's why I'm biased towards it. I don't know. Not that Vimeo is inherently like Apple or anything, but I think that YouTube's easier to work with. Uh, any other questions? Filmmaking questions too? I'm happy to, uh, happy to answer anything. YouTube is number two search engine. I, know, I did not know that. That's interesting. I know it's where you can find a lot of good content for filmmaking. It's where I found this thing, this camera, and researched it briefly before getting it. Uh, was from that, to be honest with you. YouTube's great. Don't get me wrong. YouTube's one of the best things in the world as far as like getting information and, and communicating it effectively. I mean, you guys are filmmakers, right? So you know nothing is better than the visual way of communicating. I don't think that any vertical things are going to survive very long or they'll get bought by someone else. Equipment. Um, I, my other video talks a lot about it. So we just started shooting a feature. Um, this is a lot of stuff on this at the moment, but this is a Z cam in here. Um, it's a $2,500 super 35 six K camera, um, shoots raw, uh, it's fantastic. It has um, an app. Can, I don't know. This is one of the stupidest gimmicks to me in the world, but I love it. I'll turn it on. Where is the button? But basically, technology is great because it's getting better all the time. Um, so it makes things infinitely easier to like work with, right? It's one of the things, I, if I could say anything to you guys right now, now's the time to go make something because I've said the other thing too. Go buy a T2i on eBay if you don't have a camera already. It's like less than 200 bucks, I'm pretty sure, for this camera. It's basically a 7D, um, but cheaper. It's almost as good. It's from 10 years ago, but it costs almost nothing. It, it's a Super 35 sensor. It'll work great with EF lenses, which are cheap and plentiful. 
Um, and you can go and start making a movie today. Um, the only thing you have to deal with is audio. Um, your audio is critical. Um, today there's a lot of op options for that, but basically you can get away with a lot with very little. So the best camera you have, you, you have is the one you have. So go take what you have. You got to use your phone to start doing something. Um, sometimes practice is the key to everything. Don't be afraid to work with the worst equipment either um, because anything you learn that, that now will help you later. Um, so let's see. Uh, right now, uh, Premiere, I, so I learned on Premiere originally back in 2000. I went to use Avid for a while. I went to Final Cut 7. Went back to Premiere when Final Cut did that whole Final Cut X thing, um, like Premiere, and now I'm probably going to Resolve. I just started testing and playing with Resolve. Because Resolve is free for 1080p. I mean, you can't beat free, and it's really good. And if you ever want to upgrade, it's 300 bucks. I think that's a huge win right there. So um, I don't, I don't think you can get much better than that, to be honest with you. So I don't know if you guys can see this very well. Um, but you can right now have a live view of the camera wirelessly to your mobile phone, iPhone, Android, whatever. You can control the camera completely from your phone. You can have multiple phones connected to it, all viewing the live feed. This is probably one of the best things this, thing, this camera does. You can copy clips directly to your phone, to a laptop. You, it has Ethernet. All the technology aspects are huge with it. Um, so this is the reason why I like this camera so much because of this feature. So when I'm on set, I can literally use my phone. I, I got a tablet coming. I'm going to be using with it, but I, I will have you can view constantly on set what's going on. It even sends the audio to the phone, so I can even listen to it in theory anywhere on set, basically. Um, but I I can I probably should do another event on this. I won't get to this year, um, but it's it's something. What's the next question I got here? Uh, promote for your theater run. Uh, friends and family. What's the, that's the best way to do it. And the people that worked on it. Honestly, um, that's the way to go. Friends, family, people that worked on it. Granted, on, on inspectors, I didn't have a, a huge crew, but it didn't take much to be able to promote. We had, I want to say we had, I uh, forget, like 400-ish people for our premiere. It was pretty good. The theater was 80% sold out. Uh, we came out at the same time. I believe it was not the Chronicles of Riddick, something Riddick movie, um, and we we beat it in the theater in the theater opening night for for gross dollars. That was fun. Um, we didn't beat it after that, but we beat it that night, gross dollars. Um, how do you submit your film to Amazon Prime? I will post a link. It's, I'm sad that people don't know this already, but because it's it seems like it should be simple to know, but I guess it just isn't out there. I'm disappointed with that. Here's the link. You go there and start filling stuff out. Oh, that light finally turned off. That's funny. I had this running from my other seminar. Um, so it's been, it ran for over an hour. Battery's very toasty. What other questions you guys got for me? We got five minutes left in this, uh, before the video ends. So we got time to chat. Anything else I can help you? You guys are out there. You got to have questions, anything filmmaking. I mean, are you producers, are you directors? What are you guys doing? Are you trying to be, uh, a script writer, um, where, where do you guys fit at into the whole thing right now? What are you guys doing on set, pre-production, post-production? What's the scoop with that? You guys must be doing some neat stuff. That's cool. Stop motion is pretty awesome. Writer, animator. What's uh, what type of animation are you doing? Like uh, hand drawn or computer graphics, 3D, Maya, ZBrush. 
40. Um, script writing is always a popular thing. If you can become a good writer, then you'll have a lot of success. I'm, this, I'm using Writer Duet right now, guys. If you wanted to know, I'm using Writer Duet because it allows sharing uh, the files to be easy. I used to use Adobe Story, but they canned that, which really made me mad. <laughs> it was real, so good for sharing things. Writer, director, producer. Yeah, uh, you, you, I, I hate to say it, but it sounds like we're always stuck doing that. Most of the time, writing, directing, and producing is all part of the gig. If you're not, if you're a director in a low budget situation, you are almost always producing, or nothing will happen. Uh, if you're if you're that committed, um, writing is a byproduct. I don't think I'm that great of a writer. I just kind of get down the rough idea and let the actors help me fill in the gaps. Um, stop motion yeah 3d 2d are uh, epic skills i am i am not a post-production visual effects guy i can edit i obviously edit that's where i got my start in filmmaking was because i could edit stuff i could use computers um and go figure stop motion's cool i don't know i i never i, I want to get a stop motion I'm totally off topic but um, I wanted to do a uh, a fan based film, uh, this, a spoof spin off of a movie, old movie called uh, Robot Jocks. And I getting back with they had giant robots that fought each other. And I thought that uh, I you could do with today's technology, you could do stop motion in a way that would be better than most CGI. Yeah. So, yep. There you go. It is. I, I love Robot Jocks. It's one of my favorite films. I have it on Blu-ray. Uh, and everything else and uh i i felt like you could do that today using the same technology but using the compositing and everything else we have today to bring it all together can make it so much neater um i was heavily inspired that from the uh, star trek next generation remaster they did how they took all the old effects all the old plates and everything and then they used all today's technology to put it all together um, I felt like, oh, you could totally do that with, you know, stop motion animation for something like a robot jock, even though it's a little bit different than maybe clay or different, depends on what stop motion we're talking about. But I thought it would be neat to to blend all that together. I think that's a great classic film. Um, if you go back and look at it, you notice very quickly that they did a lot with very little, um, even though it was very expensive, relatively speaking, to anything we're talking about, right? Um, they didn't have a whole lot to work with and they didn't, they, they didn't, Ha they, they really got a lot of that film for very little. Um, I don't know. I could always, I, I'm always sure. Message me on Facebook uh, or send me an email. Um, I don't know. If you're interested in that idea, maybe I'll come back to it. It's just because the issue was getting them built and having it be tested and actually making it work. Um, it's hard. To, I honestly, frankly, stop motion animation is a rare skill set nowadays. It's very neat. Um, very niche in a lot of ways, but I think that uh, it should be brought back, especially when it comes to like using real things. Because I'm, I kind of tired of CGI all the time. I kind of want to see things be practical and and use CGI to improve the practical. So, all right, we're coming down to one minute left. Any other last minute, no pun intended, questions? Yeah, and, uh, you can find me on Facebook here and my email address is here. Um, I will be posting this video up for you guys to re-review in the future. Um, I kind of want to do this again in the future. Uh, thank you, Scott. Um, and I, I think that next year at Gen Con, I'm going to have a much bigger event now because I realize that I can integrate all this a lot more if you guys are up for that. I can bring in all the filmmaking from start to finish the whole thing um, and talk about how to how you can actually outline a whole project. I might bring a basic project and go through the whole process of how to get it off the ground and, and walk you through everything, uh, including maybe shooting a scene on location and, and doing the post work. Maybe we could do that.